What you're about to watch is an interview I did with Lisa Lejeure on the topic of Roman Catholicism, trying to lay out some of the real specific reasons why I not only can't be Roman Catholic, but I can't hold hands with the Roman Catholic Church when it comes to their claims about their own authority, as well as what the gospel actually says. These are significant issues. It's difficult to tackle these topics, but hopefully this video is gonna give you clarity if you're Roman Catholic and you're watching. This is not an attack on you. I'm hoping that this creates more light than heat. That is one of the goals in this. So if you're interested to hear out why uh, I'm not a Roman Catholic, as well as why I think that Roman Catholics should reconsider the teaching that they've received, that's what this video is for, that's what this teaching is, and we're just gonna jump right into it. Oh, and if you're interested in Lisa Lejeur's ministry, I have links below to her website and her ministry, Women's Bible Study, and thank you to her for inviting me on to do this long but really needful teaching, since so many people will not really talk very carefully about this topic, but it's important. Uh, we already did two sessions on Jehovah's Witnesses, two on Mormonism, and um, now today we're gonna talk about Catholicism, which is kind of a, a big deal. Actually for both Mike and I, we're just, it's, it's a big topic. Um, what do we say? There's uh, 1.2 billion Catholics in the world. And when you talk against, not even against, but confront that, that's a big, that's a big thing to do. So uh, last week, Mike, I was in California. We were there for vacation. And apparently, you guys, it's mandatory for you to wear face masks, okay? Yeah. Um, I, I think I'm supposed to even wear one right now while I'm alone at home, I think. Is I that, think so, too. Is that required? Uh, yeah. But in Phoenix, when we left Phoenix, we were all fine. We didn't have to wear face masks to go anywhere. So I guess California, and I went to Walmart, and I tried to talk my way out of it, like, I don't really have to wear a face mask, do I? Oh, you're in. You, you don't want to walk around here without a face mask unless yeah. you want to potentially be attacked. <laughs> <laughs> well, they said, well, basically, if you want to shop, you have to wear a mask. So all that to say is that in this life, there's all these rules that we have to abide by that aren't really suggestions. And so it's kind of the same with what we're talking about today with this whole conference. Like God has like they're not suggestions on how to get to heaven and how to spend eternity with him. It's really like his way only. And so that's really the reason why we wanted to do this conference. So we're not bashing anyone's religion. So we'll talk about that for a second. Oh yeah. There's in fact, to be honest, um, this is to me one of the hardest topics to cover Catholicism because we have so much we agree on. And in so many ways it's, it, it is part of the Christian tradition yet there's out there are also important areas really important areas where there is disagreement and it's major disagreement and so it, it's it's like this challenge you see catholics on one side who you're like i love you and i want to have a relationship with you and i want to affirm you as much as i can you know with, with truth and on the other side i say but then there's this thing called catholicism that has specific doctrines and teachings and has made claims claims about the whole earth claims about the whole church claims about salvation and a bunch of stuff that's that we have to look at and we have to examine. And it, it ends up being a, a hairy issue, but it's too important not to talk about. And so many people won't even address it. Even guys I know who are great at theology, you know, great at studying and thinking about these types of things, they won't talk about Catholicism. They're just like, yeah, I don't deal with that issue. Right. And, um, and so I wanna hopefully not be harsh and judgmental and cruel about it or misrepresent and also not pretend like these things don't actually matter when they really do. They really do. And I think that's the thing. Like when Jude said, like, you've got to contend for the faith that was once delivered mm -hmm. to me, like, what does that mean? So, which actually will, will bring about our first question, which we've done, I think each one of these segments, like, first of all, even just go, what is the faith once delivered? Because people mm -hmm. are going to be confused at that right away. Yeah, so we get this actually in, in the book of Jude, where it says that we should contend earnestly for the faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. And that phrase, the faith, we, we often think is talking about your personal uh, act of believing, but it's not. It, it's actually talking about like the doctrines, like the beliefs, the theology, you might say, of that was once and for all delivered to the saints about who Jesus is and how he saves us. These are kind of like the primary things. And so we have like Romans 1.16, for instance. Paul, his attitude about the faith, he says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, <clears throat> so that we're, we're seeing that you're saved by these, these, this message of the gospel. The gospel is, 
is like a list of truths, you know? Um, it's things that we're supposed to believe about Jesus, about his death and resurrection, about our sin, and about uh, how he saves us. So these things are pretty important. In believing this gospel, in responding to God's truth that he's revealed, you relationally become joined to him, you become saved. So these are, in other words, it's kind of like saying, if I, if I handed you a pill and I said, you're going to die unless you take this pill, and let's say that it's true, how important is that pill? Right. That's pretty important. How important are the ingredients in that pill that it's made just the right way? Mm-hmm. That's pretty important. And yeah. so that's like the faith is like these core, you know, central issues of Christianity that we, we, we must hold to. We must fight for, not physically, but we, we, have, we must be committed to and strive to maintain. And you and, can't um, add yeah. to and you can't take away. You can't be like, well, I'm just going to add a few things to it. Yeah, yeah. We, we, we don't want to add or take away. And we don't want to just say like some people do, well, it's just about Jesus. It's not about theology, Mike. It's just about Jesus. And it's like, yeah, but you don't know a single thing about Jesus unless you do theology. Like that's what, that's what G, the word Jesus, unless it has a, a, a theological meaning, it's not about anything. Right. And so, yeah, we, we have a, um, like for instance, in, in the book of Galatians, the apostle Paul, he deals with false gospels in particular, a false gospel that does relate to the conversation we're having today. In Galatians 5, 4, he says, you are severed from Christ. You who would be justified by the law, you've fallen away from grace. Now, the, the thing that I want to point out about Galatians in particular is that the group of people that are there, they believe in Jesus. They believe in his death and resurrection. They believe in who he is, right? There's, Paul's not rebuking them for confusion about the person of Christ. Um, the one thing he rebukes them for is that after they thought they were saved by grace, they started adding works and thinking that those works were going to help accomplish their ultimate salvation, that it was required of them. And he effectively, he flips out, right? He apostolically flips out on them and writes Galatians. And he's like, you're severed from Christ. If you would be justified by the law, you've fallen away from grace. So what I'm saying is it's not just who Jesus is that matters. It's also how he saves. That seems to be a biblical principle that we have to hold to if we're going to be honest with scripture. So every Christian is called to know and fight for this, this, this pill <laughs> in, my, in my metaphor, this pill of essential theology about Jesus and salvation. Perfect. All right, let's talk about, let's talk about this whole idea of Catholicism because it is, like you said, extremely complicated. It just is. And a lot of Catholics, they don't even know what the church teaches, which is kind of interesting to me. And so I want to kind of have you talk about that because we did um, a, a short thing on Catholicism at, at Bible study one time and people were just, they came up and said, I had no idea the Catholic church teaches that. So why, why is that? Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, and let me, let me say from the outset, um, I've, I've spent a lot of hours on this topic and I'm very open to changing my mind. I've, I, in all honesty, I want to change my mind. Um, my concerns are that Catholicism does touch and alter essential gospel truths. And it breaks my heart. I don't want to say that, right? Like, I, I mean, I'm just being, my bias is I don't want to say this. I, I want to find a way to be able to affirm that the gospel of Jesus is intact in the authoritative teachings of the Catholic Church. And, and it breaks my heart that I say, well, in some of the teachings, it seems intact, and in other teachings, it seems like very much like it has been compromised. So I'm also convinced that this is the case. Um, now, when I talk about the complexity of, Cal- of uh, Catholicism, um, let me just mention, for those who don't know, perhaps maybe you're not Catholic, you, were, you weren't raised Catholic, they actually have a lot more than the Bible that they have to look to to understand what they're supposed to believe. So they do include the Bible, right? The Bible is an authority, but then there's this new authority or secondary authority, which is ultimately... Uh, the Pope and the bishops who are in agreement with the Pope, they have to be in agreement to be kind of included in that group. And then the priests that are underneath them in the new Testament, there are no priests there. I mean, well, I'll I'll put it this way. uh, First Peter two, nine, it tells us you are chosen race, a Royal priesthood, a holy nation. So we're, we're all priests in the new Testament, but the Roman Catholic church says, yeah, you're all priests. But in addition to that, in addition to that, there is a special class of priests, and they can give us access to, to the body and blood of Christ, access to forgiveness, access to the treasury of merit, the forgiveness of certain kinds of sins, and others you have to go up the ranks to a bishop. Um, in scripture, a bishop and an elder are synonymous terms. They're, these are leaders in local fellowships. They're not even leading whole cities. They're just leading local fellowships of, of Christians, and groups of these guys come together and kind of lead a city group. 
um, well, in Catholicism, there's, they separate this and they say, no, no, bishop is different than elder. And in the Catholic catechism, the catechism of the Catholic church, which is this book right here, this is like an official teaching from Rome. It's, oh boy, um, 900 pages. There's a lot of documents here, but this is like pretty authoritative coming from Rome on what Catholics are supposed to believe. And this is separate from scripture, of course, although it quotes the Bible a lot. But in the, in the Catechism of the Catholic Church, 1549, it says the bishop, this new class of people that's different than the New Testament, is like the living image of God. Now, the Pope is considered the chief bishop. He's like the bishop of bishops. And in the Catechism in paragraph 937, it says the Pope enjoys by divine institution nothing less than supreme, full, immediate, and universal power in the care of souls. So the, the Pope is... is is the boss, right? He's the boss actually in Catholicism. He's the boss of the world. He stands as the representative of Jesus on earth and he's in charge of all of all the Christians, all the believers in Jesus. And he's also ultimately in charge of secular governments, whether they choose to obey him or not, that's his job. It's, he is, he outranks them. Um, the official titles of the Pope are Vicar of Jesus Christ, successor of the Prince of the Apostles, Supreme Pontiff of the Universal Church, the Primate of Italy, the Archbishop uh, and, Metropolit and Metropolitan of the Roman Province, the Sovereign of Vatican City State, the Servant of the Servants of God. These are like official titles of the Pope. So when, when we look at the Pope in the Catholic Church, we're not looking at a pastor who's like a pastor for everybody or something. It's, no, it's, it's a different kind of role altogether, the degree of authority that's there. They claim that he has the, the ability to infallibly tell you what the Bible means, that the Pope or the church, when, when they're in agreement with him, have the ability to infallibly declare doctrines that you maybe have never heard of, but you are now required to submit to. So these are pretty strong claims. I mean, if, if someone in your local church down the street was like, hey guys, I'm in charge of the whole world, like you, <laughs> you, would, you would be like, that's a big claim, right? This is a big claim to authority. And the question is whether it's biblical or not, but at least you should know that's a big claim. There's um, uh, various issues related to that. We'll talk more about later, but that's just the roles, the bishop, the priest, the pope. In addition, they also have not only the Bible, but what they call sacred tradition. And sacred tradition is basically the same as scripture. They call it the word of God. And <clears throat> they, they survey kind of through church history and sort of pull out little pieces of church history. And they go, that's that's sacred tradition. This is something you have to obey. It's difficult to know what the Catholic Church thinks is authoritative tradition because it's 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 just not really lined out very carefully. Like when a church father they're quoting is authoritative or when he's he's not. Um, right. It's very difficult to tell. So this makes it confusing. Like you said, complicated. But how much content is there? Well, there's 21 ecumenical councils. The ecumenical councils are different than the church fathers in that these are, as far as Catholicism teaches, this is when like the Pope and the bishops are in agreement. And so <clears throat> the things that is that are taught in these 21 councils throughout church history, they are authoritative, infallible, and true. So it's a little more complicated than that, but that's the general idea. But just so you get an idea, this is the text from just one of those councils, Vatican II. This is the most recent council in the 1900s. This is the text from just the one council. We've got 400 pages of content. One of the 21 councils. What is in there? Like, what, what, what are they just telling like doctrine about or what you believe? Yeah, well, it's, it's a huge variety of stuff in here. So <clears throat> um, it's going to talk about decrees, about beliefs, about the role of the Pope. Um, and it, they actually upgraded uh, prior to this. They basically would have thought from the Council of Trent, a previous council, they would have thought that um, non-Catholics who will not submit to the Pope and they know about him and won't submit that they're basically they're basically damned. But. Vatican II upgraded non-Catholics to separated brethren because the, the Catholic Church is very much interested in like rejoining, reconnecting right. everyone together. But <clears throat> this is key. They still want to connect everyone together under the authority of the Pope. Okay. So nothing's really substantially changed there. Um, so there, you know, there's lots of different declarations that are in there. Um, this is the Council of Trent. This is probably the most important council, in my opinion, in the, in the, in the uh, Roman Catholic Church, at least for our interests. And the Council of Trent was in response to the Reformation of Martin Luther and John Calvin and those guys. What they did was they gathered, <clears throat> pardon me, they gathered together and they declared infallibly a whole bunch of stuff that we'll talk about today. We'll actually get into today. But you start to add all this stuff up. You've got the Bible, you've got this, you've got the other councils, the other, I mean, 19 councils of the Catholic Church. You have 
church tradition. So you have all these church fathers that you could make a mountain out of the books from the church fathers, the first uh, 800 years of the church. And this stuff starts to get overwhelming. Um, I think a lot of Catholics don't really know what Catholicism teaches. And I've even talked to informed Catholics who didn't know what Trent said. I mean, these are Catholics that are smart, intelligent, thoughtful. They read, they study, but it's just such a massive amount of data. Right. So when I talk about Catholicism, I mean all of this official stuff. I don't mean Catholics. Catholics may or may not even know or agree with, even informed, thoughtful. I, I've talked to a Catholic apologist who disagreed with the Council of Trent. I read to him from the Council of Trent, and he just said, I said, what do you think of this? And he said, I don't really know. I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> thought, yeah. So I don't want to assume anything about any Catholic, even if they're educated. Right. Um, well, so, yeah, there's, there's countless, countless stuff. There's, um, there's also Latin terms that are confusing in Catholicism for a lot of people. The priesthood, where the priest is an altar Christu, the, the treasury of merit, the nature of transubstantiation, purgatory, indulgences, the magisterium, the seven sacraments, mortal and venial sins, and those all weigh in very heavily on whether you are saved or not. Right. So I uh, actually it really asked. a different gospel. Um, what's that? It really does become a different gospel when you add all of that stuff into it. It's not just the simple <laughs> gospel that, that, you know, we're supposed yeah. to. Yeah, it's definitely not simple. It's definitely added to the gospel. And then the real tough question is, do those additions actually compromise the gospel? Or are they just like unnecessary additions? And in many exactly. cases, they're just unnecessary additions. But in other cases, I think that they really do compromise the actual gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace. So um, I asked a devout Roman Catholic friend how to be saved. I was like, how is it that not just when I am like a baby getting baptized, like how is it that me, you know, I put my faith and trust in Christ and then I'm like, I get old and I die. 70 years old, I die. How is it that I will be saved? Please just explain it to me. And he said that he didn't want to answer the question. He's a devout Roman Catholic, thoughtful man, because he was afraid he would get the answer wrong. Because on Catholicism, the gospel is incredibly complicated. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the concern. We had dinner with a, a priest one time and I asked him if he were to die that night, um, would he go to heaven? And he was like, I have no idea. I said, well, what about me? Am I going? And he said, well, I'm a speedboat. You're a rowboat. That, that was his comment. And I was like, well, I'm a speedboat, you're a rowboat. Yeah. I mean, he's going to get there faster than me. And I'm thinking, I, I said, I don't think that's really what the Bible says, but anyway, okay. Go to, uh, so like, unlike Mormonism and Jehovah witness, mm -hmm. Catholics really do believe a lot of the same thing. So like, you know, we know Catholic or Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons do not believe in the same Jesus of the Bible, mm -hmm. but Catholics do. So what are a couple things that we do agree on? Well, um, <clears throat> this is huge. This is, I mean, this, this, this Catholicism is not Mormonism. It's not Jehovah's Witnesses. I don't really feel like I can put it in the same category. And it's not, these, these no, are, but I felt like we needed to talk about it. Yeah, and these are some of the reasons why. Um, we believe in Jesus. Like, Catholics would hold arm in arm with me to proclaim who Jesus was, that he was born of a virgin, he lived a sinless life, he rose bodily from the grave, he ascended to heaven, and he's returning in glory to judge mankind. They would affirm all these things. They would affirm the Trinity the very nature of God, which is a huge, huge issue. I mean, this is a big issue that separates, you know, true Christian doctrine from false doctrines. Um, and they would affirm that there's one God, he exists eternally in three distinct, but co-equal persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This sets Catholicism apart from like some sort of weird apparent groups. It's not, it's not Islam. It's not uh, Mormonism, it's not Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not any of that kind of stuff. It is truly, I mean, you could say it's truly a Christian tradition. It's truly a Christian tradition. And, and, and as far as the world's concerned, as far as the visible church is concerned, there's so many ways in which Catholicism is part of Christianity. It right. is. And, and I want to acknowledge that. They respect the Bible. It goes more than that. They respect the word of God, that the Old and the New Testaments are inspired. That's a belief that they're infallible. That's, you know, a lot of Catholics believe that. <laughs> some of the theologians nowadays are a little eh, on that. But the same can be said for some Protestant theologians. This is just a doctrine that a lot of people are compromising. Um, but the problem is that the Bible, while they respect it and believe it's God's word, it's not the only word of God in Catholicism, right? There's the, there's a lot more outside the Bible that is considered God's word than in the Bible that's considered God's word. That's a problem. Um, but on, on things like moral issues, like pro-life issues, pro-marriage, pro-family values, we're so in agreement on, on tons of essential and divisive issues. We agree with, with, uh, Catholicism and Catholics. So the, even the first creeds of the church, the first creeds of the church that are kind of like meant to like separate true Christianity from 
you know, false beliefs, we would agree with those. We'd be able to echo, you know, the Nicene Creed together. But there becomes a lot of problems as you keep tracking down and those problems do touch the gospel itself. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, it's funny because people are like, why are you just being so nitpicky about this? Like, like it's ridiculous. We're just, we're close enough. But I, I kind of don't think that's true. And I think that's what scares me the most. It's like, this is a big issue because salvation is at stake. Yeah. I, I, I want it. I wish I was being nitpicky. I even called friends uh, multiple people um, who are, in, you know, th- they do theology, they're theology guys. I even talked to an, uh, the author of a book on Catholicism, who's a Protestant who affirms that Catholics are, that their gospel is good. Their gospel is solid, right? And I, while I would affirm lots of Catholics are saved, lots of Catholics are saved. I think it's in spite of the teachings of Catholicism. I'm going to address the teachings today, not the salvation of every individual Catholic, which is depending on what they personally believe. Right. Um, but uh, but yeah, I don't, I don't think that's the case. Um, I, I, I call these guys and I was like, please help me, convince me, please help me that, that the Catholic gospel doesn't compromise the essential gospel of Jesus Christ when it comes to working for your salvation. And what I found was that even the Christians that I talked to who affirmed that the Catholic gospel does save, that it's salvific, that according to Trent, according to the official canons of the church, those guys didn't have any really good reasons. Like they just said, well, you know, you don't have to have right theology in order to be saved or perfect theology. And I was like, yeah, well, I agree. You don't have to have perfect theology. But it seems to me that the book of Galatians outlines that you do need to believe it's by grace. Right. And that when you add works, it's no longer the gospel of Christ. That this seems to be the clear teaching of Galatians. And the guys I talked to were like, yeah, that's a tough one. And I thought, here they are affirming that this gospel is true, which is a big affirmation. Yeah. And they don't even have a good reason. And that concerns me. So um, <clears throat> it's not just the gospel, though. There's other issues, too, that do really matter, even though they're not sal- salvation related. Right. And that is that the Catholic Church has this the magisterium or the, the authoritative teaching structure of the Catholic Church, the Pope, ultimately, and the bishops when they agree with him. Um, these are radical authority claims that they make. And tons of new doctrines have been added over the years. Um, we, we just can't. We can't just pretend that nothing's, in fact, this is the version of ecumenicism that we get from Catholicism. Hey, those issues don't matter. Now come under the wing of the church and accept all of our authority. And you're like, wait a minute, you can't say it doesn't matter and then still keep making your authority claims. It, It turns out that the Roman Catholic church is the divisive one. They're saying we have full authority over you and you just need to give in. And that's their version of ecumenicism. It's like, yeah, just, just, just yield. All right. Just yield to these authority claims. And we'll talk more about the authority too. Uh, if you had 30 seconds in an elevator to tell someone what the difference, what, what would you say? That's tough. So <clears throat> let me give it a shot. Um, maybe I could try to boil it down to like a few, just a handful of issues. And I'd say, well, um, the first thing I'd say is, you know, Catholics stick around, hear me out you probably feel like I'm personally attacking you, but you haven't heard the reasons, all the reasons I'm going to give for why I'm saying these things. But I'll say that I do think the Catholic church has um, unbiblical authority that the Roman Catholic church in particular, and especially the Pope, they claim authority over every Christian, how we live and what we believe, and that we have to actually be submissive to the Pope in order to be saved. This is an official claim of the church, although it's muddied by Vatican II, but it is a classic claim Um, with the false authority that they have that they weren't given by Jesus and that isn't in the new Testament or the first century or the second century or the third century without false authority. They made countless additions and changes to the Bible, adding unbiblical traditions. And Jesus had a problem with this, right? He complained about the Pharisees because they were teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men in Mark seven, seven. Yeah. You're teaching as doctrines, the commandments of men. This, this is what Jesus came against. If Jesus comes against that sort of thing, shouldn't I, if Paul comes against a gospel that adds works, shouldn't I do the same? And the gospel itself in Catholicism is confused. It's fundamentally, I hate to say it, but it's been compromised, uh, compromised the grace of Christ. Right. The official teachings here, I'm not talking about individual Catholics who may affirm the grace of Jesus Christ entirely, but the official teachings of the church is that grace is, is um, necessary, but it's not enough. Right. You need works too. And the councils outright deny the sufficiency of faith in Christ for salvation. You have to add your works to earn your salvation. And those works are not just fruit of what Jesus did. 
So that ultimately speaks of a rejection of the, of the fullness of the sacrifice of Christ. And it sounds to me like a compromise of the gospel. Right. Yeah. It sounds like that to me too. Um, talk to me because whenever I talk to people about Catholicism, they'll say, but we were the first church. We, yeah. we were the first people. So can you kind of give, I, I had a girl write to me before and to ask like, at what point in history did the church be the Catholic church? Like it's very confusing. Like, you know, so explain that history, uh, you know, so we can understand it better. Yeah. Um, I've heard this a lot too, and it does come up a lot. This is, this is, um, this is a good sign that the person you're talking to hasn't really thought about these issues and definitely hasn't studied. Maybe they've looked at like Catholic answers website or something, but they haven't like actually studied the topics themselves. So the word Catholic you know, originally the word just means universal. That's all it means. It, it's not a title for a denominational group. Catholicism is basically like a big denomination. It's not a title for that. It just means universal. Originally, the the early church writers would use the term. It never, it's never in the New Testament, but they'd use the term to say, we're talking about true believers everywhere. That's all they meant by the true church, by the Catholic church, the universal church, or you might think of the invisible church, the, all the real believers in Jesus everywhere. Over time, over time, hundreds and hundreds of years, Rome started saying the Catholic Church is whoever is submitting to Rome. Okay. This is radically sectarian. This is like, what are you doing, dude? This is like not, the gospel of Christ is this organic thing that creates this organism of the body of Christ. They're saying, no, no, whoever submits to Rome, that's ultimately the Catholic Church. Roman Catholic as a title is not the same as saying the universal church, where you're using the word like a definitional term universal instead of a name for a denominational type schismatic group, which is what Catholicism ultimately is. The first church was in the first century, right? In the New Testament epistles and acts, um, we can read about this early church. We don't, you don't read about the Roman Catholic church in the Bible anywhere or in the first century or the second century for that matter. There's a, uh, there's a book by uh, Jerry Walls and Kenneth Collins that I would recommend. I think it's very interesting. Don't agree with them on everything, but have a lot of great content on there. And it's called Roman, but not Catholic. And that's kind of their thesis in their book. It's like, oh yeah, you're the Roman church. But when you say you're the Catholic church, that's not true. You aren't the universal church. You're, you're claiming this like special status for your group and trying to rob it from everybody else. And that's what we would say in response. Yes, there is a Catholic church. It's, uni it's the universal church, like lowercase c, the Catholic church. But when yeah. you say Catholicism is the universal church, that's just not true. So after... Um Jesus, after the early church, after the apostles, how, how did it even show up? Like, you know what I mean? Because it went bishop and then different areas. And I mean, how did it suddenly Peter's the Pope? Like, how, how did that even happen? Oh, well, that happened really gradually over time. And so um, the, the, the first time we see a connection between bishops and Peter that I'm aware of is in the late second century. So over 100 years after Jesus, we have Leo um, in Rome, who's suggesting that that he's getting, um, that his office connects to Peter's office. He's connecting it to Peter. But at the time, <clears throat> they were more thinking that every bishop is connected to Peter. It wasn't like just the Roman guy is. That wasn't really the, the, the view. That was much later development over time. So basically, and we'll get more into this a little bit later, but, but the development is very gradual and historical. And what I think most Catholics think is that um, the modern Roman Catholic view of who the Pope is and of his role, that that was pretty much held throughout time. And th that's demonstrably false. There's just, there's no way to maintain this belief, even though you have to believe that to believe what the councils of the church say. They're like, it's always been the case, but we'll talk a little bit more about that. I think later, uh, if we have okay. some questions on that. All right. Because, okay. So the next question is this, uh, like we, we talk a lot about um, how the Catholic church is added on to Jesus a lot. Like we're saying like if faith in Jesus, that's just the way it is. So this is going to be a really long, like this will probably take up the rest of the first session, I would assume. Um, but it's really, really important to see what, what have they added to this whole Jesus alone concept. So. All right. Well, what I'm going to do here, and I want to remind <clears throat> Catholic viewers of this, <coughs> pardon me is that I'm going to be quoting from Catholic sources. So if you want to say that I'm misrepresenting Catholicism, what you need to do is go to those quotes and figure out why they don't mean what I'm saying they mean or what they seem to mean as you read them at face value. Don't just assert, as I see in my videos all the time, Mike doesn't understand Catholicism. And I'm like, I just quoted Trent. 
<laughs> I just quoted right. the catechism. <clears throat> you know, you need to do better than that. You can't just wave, wave, wave it away. So I encourage people to really think these things through. I know that our, our blood gets hot. I'm trying not to be that way. I encourage you to not be that way as well. So um, in a biblical view of, of, of the gospel, right? We trust in Jesus. That is, we repent and believe. So I turn from sin towards faith in Christ. And I get all of the benefits of Christ through faith. Meaning I don't do anything to earn it. So I have justification, which means that the imputation of my sin to Jesus, like it talks about in First Corinthians, that that happens. I have, I am then declared righteous, and this is key. And the righteousness I have, it's a declaration, and it's God's righteousness or Jesus's righteousness, not my own. So Philippians 3.9 talks about this. Notice that the righteousness I have is not my own. It says, and be, that Paul wants to be found in him, in Jesus, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, as in not works. Because to Paul, faith and works are two antithetical ideas. It's either faith or works. And he's like, you get righteous and you get there by faith apart from your works. So that, that's the gospel, right? You're, you're saved by faith. In fact, Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 10, it says, by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice this. I, I included verse 10 because I know it's important here. Um, we're saved apart from works, but works are then a future result of our salvation, right? We then do good works because we're saved. We don't do them to get saved. So saved by grace through faith apart from works, resulting in works. This is, this is because Romans eleven six it gives us, and this is honestly, this is, one, this is one of my key verses in the whole issue with, Catholic, with Catholicism. Romans eleven six says, if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Catch this. This is key. Paul, the apostle, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is defining the terminology of salvation. And he says, Grace means no works. If you add works, it's not grace anymore. And that's going to be my thesis on, on Catholicism. Once you add works, it's not grace anymore. So you could say, oh, it's grace plus works, but ultimately it's just works now based on what Paul says in Romans eleven six. I've never heard a good Catholic response to Romans eleven six. I'd like to. I'm interested, but I've, I've asked. I've just never heard one. So Romans 10 verses 3 and 4, giving us the gospel, it says, for being... Um, excuse me, giving an explanation of why um, the the Jews, many of the Jews, not all of them, uh, were rejecting the gospel of Christ. It says they were being ignorant of the righteousness of God and seeking to establish their own. They did not submit to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Yet Catholicism will teach that we're, we maintain our salvation through our righteous deeds. Romans 4 verses 4 through 5, it says this, now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteous. Now in Roman Catholicism, this whole idea of due, of, of what, you're, what you are owed, D-U-E, <laughs> um, that concept is actually part of the gospel. They think that you're going you're gonna to be owed salvation because of what you did. This is a big, now they're going to add Jesus. So it's Jesus and you. But, but according to Romans eleven six, 6, according to the gospel of, of, of uh, the New Testament, this is not the case. Like this isn't a possibility. So we have all these beautiful things, right? What <clears throat> we're, we're saved, we're justified. The righteousness of Jesus is, is imputed to me as my sins have been imputed to him. Um, and then salvation results in then following up sanctification. That's a fancy word for you become more like Jesus, right? You're more godly in your heart, in your behaviors, but that's the fruit of, of salvation. Salvation is clearly by grace through faith. That's my salvation. The result of it, as it plays out in my life, is fruit. This is what First John talks about. He's like, basically, if I could summarize First John for us, right? Hey, if you're saved, you're going to look like it, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> and he doesn't say you're going to be good to earn your salvation. He's talking about it being, if you're born of God, you're going to love. Like, this is the result of it. It's not how you get it. It's what it causes. That's, that's huge. Now let's talk about the Roman Catholic view instead of the, I went through sort of a biblical view very briefly and quickly. Um, a Roman Catholic view is that your justification and your final entrance into eternal life, it requires sanctification or your obedience, your personal holiness. 
And their view of justification is very different than what we see from Paul, the apostle, who he seems to think justification is you're declared righteous, like God declares you righteous on behalf of Christ's righteousness. So it's, it's alien to me, right? Not of, not of myself. A righteousness is not from my works. It's from Christ. But on Catholicism, justification is, is like a substance you're given where God like makes you righteous or makes you a good person. And then you have to live out that good person life in order to keep your salvation. Okay. So it's, so it's, uh, God does work in me. So grace is involved, but then it's completed by works. Starts with grace, finishes with works. So it's a process. Uh, let's read from the Council of Trent, uh, Canon 32, where it says, if anyone says that the good works of the one justified are in such manner the gifts of God, that they are not also the good merits of him justified, or that the one justified by good works that he performs, notice that the guy's justified according to them by good works he performs, by the grace of God and the merit of Jesus Christ, whose living member he is, does not truly merit an increase of grace, eternal life, and in case he dies in grace, the attainment of eternal life itself, and also an increase of glory, let him be anathema. So th- th- let's leave this on the screen, this text here for a minute, but I want you guys to realize first, we don't usually talk this way. So you don't usually start a long run-on sentence. This is just, you know, people just did this more in the past than they do currently. Um, but they're saying, look, if you make these claims, you're anathema. And if you're, so if you deny that you are meriting an increase of grace through your good works, then you're, you're anathema, which means you're accursed. Now, there's a debate over what anathema means. Does it mean we just kick you out of the Catholic Church, or does it mean you're not saved? I'm like, I'm not going to worry about that. The point is, it's giving you the doctrine of Catholicism. You merit an increase of grace. Now, if we could go to Romans 11:6, 6, here's my point. Meriting grace is incoherent. It's, 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 it's a meaningless phrase. These are words that just don't make any sense when you put them together, because merit is earning and grace is unearned. Romans eleven six. if it's by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. This is like shocking. And this is these are the verses I quote in Trent to every Catholic I talk to. I say, explain this to me. And I've, I've yet to see a good answer um, in response. Let's, let's give you another one, Trent Canon 24. Now, this is the authoritative, inf- according to the church, the Catholic church, infallible teaching of the church. They say, if anyone says that the justice received is not preserved and also not increased before God through good works, but that those works are merely fruits and signs of justification obtained, but not the cause of its increase, let him be anathema. Now, this is still doctrine in Catholicism. They have not left behind Trent. Um, and you can look at the modern Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2068. This is, this is more recent, right? This is the, you know, in case people are thinking, well, Trent's old school, but like you don't understand Catholicism if you think Trent doesn't apply anymore. But the Council of Trent teaches that the Ten Commandments are obligatory for Christians and that the justified man is still bound to keep them. The Second Vatican Council confirms the bishops, successors of the apostles, received, received from the Lord the mission of teaching all peoples and of preaching the gospel to every creature. And then listen to how it defines the gospel. So that all men may attain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. So this is significant because the, the Catholic Church is teaching us that we can get saved in part by observing the commandments, by doing good works. Now, we would agree that we're bound by our faith and trust in Christ and our new birth to obey God and to walk in holiness. And you can't just uh, easy believism. I just say, oh, I believe and I can do whatever I want with my life. We're not teaching that. But they're teaching that these works are actually causing you to be saved. And they say that that's the gospel. Now, when we go to the Bible, it seems to completely refute this. In, in the verses I quoted before, but I'll add another, Galatians 2.16. It says, yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law. What, what did they say? You're going to increase your justification through obeying the commandments. Those are works of the law, right? Galatians 2.16 says you're not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. So I have to pick between, you know, Paul's view and Rome's view. In Rome's view, we're saved by grace and works, But Paul makes it very clear. There's no both and here. It's one or the other. And he adds, and this is the scary part to me. He's like, and if you add works, grace is gone. And that's the part that scares me because I I don't feel like I can just say, um, 
Catholicism, yeah, they uh, they have a wrong gospel, but it, it's okay. They're still saved because you don't have to be right about everything to be saved. Which, which, sure, you don't have to be right about everything, but you do have to be right about this, I think, based yeah. on what you know, Galatians teaches us. So it's possible in Roman Catholic theology um, that you could have true faith in Jesus, but not have enough of your own good works to actually be saved because it involves grace and works. Works aren't just fruit. They earn grace, which is an incoherent idea, but that's what they teach. Staying saved, you staying saved depends on your good works. And it's not just do good stuff. So let's talk about some of the good works that you're supposed to do. Because we talked about just the commandments. You're supposed to obey the 10 commandments, they say. Um, But there's more. Uh, First, you get baptized. It starts with baptism. According to the Catholic Church, being justified or declared righteous um, before God is actually a process. It's a process. And it begins at the moment of baptism and then progresses and is maintained by a person's participation in these seven sacraments. Have you heard of the seven sacraments before? Yeah, most of us have, right? We're, we've at least, at least heard of the seven sacraments, even if we're not too familiar with them. I know you have because you've watched my teachings on this stuff. <laughs> so, um, but the seven sacraments of the Catholic Church are, and I'll go through them really quick here, my version of really quick, um, <laughs> baptism. One is, the first one I'll, I'll mention is baptism. Um, specifically, you're supposed to be baptized with a, a, a formula that's approved of by the church. Um, and it generally happens a, at infancy. Generally, it's an there for one second, because when you're talking about the sacraments, so this is what they have to do to acquire grace into their life. So in order to be saved, this is something that they are required to do. Yes, is they that, see the sacraments like, as ways of getting grace. Okay. And I love, and I can't wait to get to that part about grace, because it that totally made me understand now how Catholics think. Like I never kn- knew that before. So we'll get to that eventually. But yeah. This, they have to do. Go ahead. Yeah. And like I said, thankfully, a lot of Catholics wouldn't even, would be like, wait, Trent says what? Like right now they're learning and they're going, I didn't know that because lo and behold, they've been Catholic their whole life and they never even believed this. And I'm like, yeah, you know, because I want them just to trust in Jesus Christ, man. And, and whether they are, are officially Catholic or not is not my main concern. I want them to be saved. Um, yeah. But, but this is the teaching of the church. Um, so, so you start by getting baptized according to the Catholic encyclopedia, baptism quote, makes us Christians. Um, and it's also, according to Vatican II, baptism is, quote, only a beginning, but necessary for salvation. So baptism is one of the many steps that you need to take in order to be saved. Now, against this, the Bible actually has examples of unbaptized, saved people, even after the gospel was being proclaimed. So you can't say, well, that's Old Testament, right? Um, in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius and his family, they are saved, filled with the Spirit, speaking in tongues, and then Paul's uh, Peter's like, I guess we should let him get baptized now. I mean, look, God saved them already. So this, so you can't you can't have this like law that baptism is required for salvation based on that. Um, then the second one is penance. Penance is kind of complicated, especially for like a Protestant mind or someone who's not part of Catholic Church, because you just you have no idea what's penance. Like, what is that? You know, um, penance has to involve a few elements. Uh, one it involves contrition over sin. So you being truly and genuinely sorrowful over sin. Now we think that's a good thing and that that's like an element of repentance and putting faith in Christ. So that's good. But it goes a lot further than that. They believe it involves confession and specifically confession to the priest. And so now you're like, oh yeah, that's why they have these confessionals in the Catholic church. That's why you go to the priest to tell him about your sins. This is actually the part that I think most Catholics don't like about Catholicism it's from the one, the guys I've talked to. And they're just like, man, I just don't think I should have to talk to the priest about, and it's embarrassing and it's awkward and other types of things. But um, according to the Catholic church, the priest is an altar Christ, uh, an al- alternate Christ. He's another Jesus. An altar Christu is the term. Vatican II says this, the priest receives a special sacrament by which through the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he is conformed to Christ, the priest, in such a way that he can act in persona Christi, that is in the very person of Jesus Christ. So when the priest goes, or when you go to the priest, it's like you're actually going to Jesus for forgiveness. Of course, the implication is that you can't just go to Jesus normally without that guy. But that is ultimately the teaching of the church. There are exceptions, but the general rule is you need a priest to be forgiven. Pope Benedict the 16th, recent guy, he said the priest is, quote, the minister of their salvation. Wow, those are big terms for people who really read the New Testament. You go, well, you don't don't really usually talk like that, you know. Um, Only the church has the power to forgive sins. They believe that there is this thing called the treasury of merit. And so when I go in and confess, I I need, remember, it's not just grace. I need works to help me with the forgiveness of my sins. 
Jesus's works, but also Mary's works and the saints works. So there's, imagine if you can, a big bank vault in the sky. And in this bank vault, it's called the treasury of merit. This is Catholic theology. And in that bank vault, you have the works of Jesus, the works of Mary, and the works of the saints, but not just any works. It's the works they did that were um, even more than enough. Because saints are, are people who've done more than enough works to enter heaven. So their extra works can be stored up in this bank vault. And I go to the priest and I say, hey, priest, I, I confess I did this. And he's like, okay, spiritually, I have the keys. I'm going to unlock the bank vault, take some of those merits, and I'm going to apply them to you so that I'm, I'm the one bringing you forgiveness through the works of other people other than Jesus. I mean, this is... Ah, it's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it doesn't make, it doesn't, it does, it's not biblical. It's, yeah. As much as I love Catholics, I, I, I have to like, I'm shocked. I'm shocked when I hear these, these teachings. So finally, the third part of penance is following the instructions of a priest. So whatever he tells you to do afterwards. Usually this involves like praying 10 Our Fathers or 10 Hail Marys, uh, praying the rosary. You know, it's something you do to merit grace. Um, at times, it requires a religious pilgrimage to a shrine of Christ or Mary or wearing painful clothing or, or doing some other charitable deeds, some other good works. Um, in America, it's more relaxed. I think in South America, they often give them bigger jobs to right. get forgiveness. Um, so this deals with specific of, sins. Is it kind of like uh, you're at ground zero with with uh, grace in your life and then you know you, you sin, so you lose a little and then you have to go up more and then... You do something bad, and it, it, your whole goal in your life is to just build this grace up to where you have enough for when you die. I mean, is that kind of is that sort of what you're saying here? Um, it's kind of like that. So th they have venial sins and mortal sins; these two different kinds of sins. We'll talk more about them later, but briefly, I'll just say this: venial sins are sins that you have to pay for, but you're still you're still saved, right? Like you committed a sin, and you'll pay for it in purgatory or in this life, and you go to the priest to deal with venial sins. Hey, I did this. It's not the worst thing in the world, but, and he gives you forgiveness. Then there's mortal sins. Now, when you commit a mortal sin, you lose the grace of salvation in, on Catholic theology. So like not attending mass is generally considered a mortal sin. So you don't go to mass, you lose salvation that week. When you go back, you confess and the priest kind of gives you back salvation. You actually walk in unsaved and you leave saved again. And you can do this over and over again throughout your life. So the, the problems with this are a, a lot, but one of them <laughs> is that you're, you're earning grace. And that's incoherent. I'm going to put this verse up again because I want you guys to memorize it. Romans 11, 6. If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. Now, Catholicism says that works are, ne are necessary. Doesn't that mean that that's no longer grace? I think the answer is very sadly. I think the answer is yes. So there's also, there's no Roman Catholic priesthood in the Bible for this, this doctrine of penance, this sacrament. There's no priesthood in the Bible that's like the Roman Catholic one. Um, I've actually already shared this verse in first Peter two, nine. So we, we don't need to put it up again, but we're all a, a Royal priesthood and there's no mention of the kind of Catholic priesthood that you'd think would be pretty important since it's essential for your salvation, right? Mm -hmm. To mention it somewhere in the new Testament, according to the Bible, you go straight to God through Jesus. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. He's our high priest. In fact, first Timothy two, five, it says that there's one God and there's one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. But in Catholicism, priests are the mediators between you and your mediator. There's lots of mediators. The saints, the priests, Mary, they're all mediators between you and your one mediator. Well, wait a minute. If there's only one mediator, then why do I have so many? So let's talk about the third sacrament, which is Eucharist. And I'm going to move through some of these more quickly, but Eucharist we'll spend a little more time on. Um, this is actually what's meant by the word mass. When we say going to mass, what they mean is you're going to partake of Eucharist or it's the communion meal, right? The bread and the wine. That's what it's referring to, the bread and the wine. But Eucharist is a very particular doctrine in the Catholic Church. Um, they believe in what's called transubstantiation. And again, we're getting into the complexity of Catholicism here. Um, this is basically where the bread and the liquid and the wine, in their view, it literally, not symbolically, but literally becomes the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And and it, and it, it maintains the substance or it, the substance of bo the body and blood of Jesus and the accidents or the appearance of bread and wine. So it looks like bread and wine, but literally physically, it's actually the body and blood of Christ. Now, the reason why this is kind of important is because in Catholicism, um, you need the Eucharist. It's part of, it's a sacrament. It's how you're going to gain uh, more grace that you're going to need for your life for salvation. But the only way you can get a hold of the Eucharist is through the priest. 
because the priest, he's the one who literally invokes the body. He holds it up and he brings it back down. And now it's the body and blood of Jesus. So if you had communion on your own or a group or, or a Christian church has communion somewhere, that's not the Eucharist. That, that doesn't work because they're not priests, right? That, so this kind of like says, oh, now you need the Catholic church to administer to you these special sacraments in order to be saved. Um, now in the scripture, it's just in remembrance, right? But this is actually, isn't just in remembrance of Jesus. This is Jesus. The Eucharist is Jesus. And we can have a long discussion. There's lots of verses that come up when you have this conversation. But this is one of the reasons why um, in the Catholic Church, they have the adoration or the worship of the Eucharist. And it makes sense because they think it's Jesus. So they're worshiping it. I, it's, I'm confused as to whether Jesus is alive or dead in the Eucharist. That's a little bit confusing to me because it's, isn't he alive and forever alive? And yet he would have to be dead for you to be consuming him as a sacrifice. That I have a question about. Um, and it's too much to get into historically, but basically it evolved over time. This doctrine of the Eucharist evolved over time. Catholic apologists will often quote select passages from different church fathers throughout history, but they won't tell you what church history actually says about the issue. It's very select. It's a very edited version of church history to support their teachings. But this ultimately forgets the Jewishness of Jesus and his disciples. They're not going to eat blood. <laughs> um, you know, this is, it's, it's symbolic. It's representative. The Passover meal is representative of Christ. Um, they, they didn't think they were drinking blood. That was forbidden. And it was continually forbidden. Even in Acts 15, the church was forbidden to, to drink blood. And so what Eucharist is requiring us to drink blood to be saved. And yet they're being forbidden to drink blood. Jesus in John 6 talks about his flesh and blood, but in, he continues to make it clear that he's talking about it in a uh, symbolic sense. John 6, 63 he says, it's the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Meaning that you're, you're to believe the message. That's how you partake of Christ is believing in his message. Believing in him is how you eat his flesh and drink his blood. And this isn't about actually communion uh, so much as communion is about the believing in Christ. <laughs> That's actually what it's really about. You know, we went to a Catholic church one time and they wouldn't let us take communion. And now that actually makes sense now because it mm. wouldn't do me any good according to them because I'm yeah. not Catholic, so I don't need the grace and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you're not part of their their fellowship in that. So yeah, you yeah you don't get to partake of communion with them. So it's not believing in Jesus is enough. You have to submit to the to the Roman Pontiff, you know. Um, and it's more complicated than that, though. I think they may have some people who don't quite submit to the Roman Pope, but they can still take communion. I I, I shouldn't speak too harshly on that because I don't know how how that all works out. A lot of these issues are very complicated. Right. So, so yeah, Eucharist, that's, that's needed for salvation, according to them. Um, so mass involves, and this is where we get to the theology, theology of it. I want us to really understand this. Mass or the Eucharist, the, the whole event, what, the reason why they're doing this, the reason why you need this is because it involves, and I'm going to be very careful with my words here, representing the sacrifice of Jesus to the Father in order to appease God's wrath and cover over people's sins. So Jesus is sort of, He's not being sacrificed again in the mass. He's, his, he's being, but he is being offered again, right? He's being re-offered freshly for your sins that you have committed up until that point. Next week, we'll do it again. So, so that's what mass involves. And it, grace is given out piecemeal in Roman Catholicism, pieces of grace here and there throughout your life. This is part of the reason why the, the guy you talked to was like, I'm not sure if I'm saved. I'm not sure if I would actually go to heaven because it's, you know, it's like, am I in grace right now? Let me think. Have I committed any more? He was a priest sins? crying out loud. Like you'd think by by now he would <laughs> like it was it, yeah. I felt so horrible for him. But that's the outgrowth of their theology, right? So um so it's um it's not just what happens to the bread and and wine that they become the body and blood of Christ. It's what they do in your life that's really important in Catholicism. They apply the grace of Jesus in little pieces. You get you get it again today, you get it again next week. But what does scripture say about this? Does scripture weigh in on this re-offering of Jesus? Um, Hebrews 10 verses 11 through 14. And I've got underlined a couple parts of it for you. I've been underlined. A lot of the underlines are all me. Okay. So obviously the Bible doesn't come <laughs> with underlines, nor does the catechism or anything else. But Hebrews 10, 11 through 14, it says, every priest, this is speaking of the Old Testament, stands ministering daily and offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from that time waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So wait, one offering. How many offerings are there in the Catholic Church? Well, every Sunday, there's countless offerings around the world. 
But according to this text, Jesus was offered once and then he sat down. He no longer offers himself again and again, which would imply that the job's not done. Instead, verse 14 makes it so clear by one offering that was 2000 years ago. He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. And this is, I love this because I, I am perfected in Christ. I'm forgiven. I'm assured of my salvation. I'm still growing in sanctification. I'm still growing to be more like Jesus. I'm being sanctified, but I am perfected forever by the one sacrifice that happened a long time ago, meaning that communion is really important, but the Eucharist is not a biblical teaching. Right. The mass is just, in, in Roman Catholicism, you can take in the blood of Jesus thousands of times and still die and go to hell. That's, that's a pretty scary. big deal. That would scare me. Like, I don't know that I would want to become a Catholic just because I would never feel assured of my salvation. Like, I, I don't know who would ever want that. Mm -hmm. And then oh, here's a question. As a Christian, I commit sins. I have issues in my life. How do I go about getting right with God? And there is a relational break. There, I mean, I'm not, I don't lose my salvation as I commit a sin, but there's like a, I feel the damage in my walk with God, right? Like there is that relational issue that's going on there. Well, Romans 5, it talks about how you, uh, how do you get continued grace from God for the sins that you continue to commit? Romans 5 verses 1 and 2. Notice how it answers this question. Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So it's not like the priests, right, who invoke Jesus for us to get us right again and again after potentially losing our salvation again and again. Instead, it's more like, no, I stand in grace and I access it not through a priesthood, not through Eucharist. I access it by faith the same way I got saved. I just, I just continue believing in Jesus and, that's, and I continue benefiting from his salvation. That's it. That's why I have peace with God. But in Roman Catholicism, it's more like a ceasefire, right? Well, you got peace right now, but later today you might commit a mortal sin. Peace is over. So it's, it's a pretty big deal. Um, I'll move quicker now <laughs> through these, through these seven <laughs> sacraments pretty quick, actually. So the fourth one is confirmation. This occurs when a bishop lays his hand on the head of a Catholic signifying that they're coming of age. So this is like their free will decision to be a Catholic. Another sacrament is matrimony or marriage. It's a big deal to have a Catholic wedding. Um, this is part of the reason why they seek because they see marriage as a sacrament. It's part of the reason why they think that you, that divorce is actually impossible. So they allow annulments, but not divorces. Um, and I, I did actually just did a whole teaching on that. <laughs> so I dealt with that as well. Um, and I will be doing a video on Catholic annulment coming up, a short video coming up sometime in the next month or so. Um, then there's, uh, you know, you don't have to all be married. I'm not saying you have to, you have to do every one of these sacraments. These are just ways of getting grace, right? Um, the holy orders, which is the office of the bishop, priests, or deacon, or the pope, these types of things are a sacrament. Um, now, you don't do that as a Catholic. You never do that, right? But you need them in place because they're helping to get you grace. That's the idea. They give you access to grace. And then finally, the anointing of the sick or the last rites. Her last rites, you know, where the priest comes and the, you know, it's not just a ritual. In the, in the Catholic theology, the last rites is where the priest is uh, uh, resolving and absolving you of mortal sins, venial sins. Your hope is to avoid purgatory, to get you a clean slate and to make sure that you get to heaven. Because even though you have faith in Jesus, even though you really trust in him, it's not enough. You need more. And so you need this access to this ultra Christ, alt alternate Christ, ultra Christu, because he's going to once again, give you access to the treasury of merits and grace and get rid of your sins and stuff like that. And uh, those are, those are the seven sacraments, but it's not it. That's not all you have to have to be saved in Catholicism because you have to just observe the commandments, whatever that means. Right. That's what the catechism says in chapter 20, 68. All men may attain salvation through faith, baptism, and the observance of the commandments. So we have to follow the commandments. Um, yet the verse, and I'll put it up again because I want to burn it into our hearts. Romans 5, 1, look at verse 2. We have, ac we have uh, also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. Not by works, not by sacraments of things we do. We've, we've got access by faith. That's it. So typical Catholics do not know all the stuff I just told you. And many of them are going to be so mad at me right now as they hear me talk about this, that they're just thinking, Mike's just making stuff up. I'm not going to believe it. Well, well, no. That's okay. At least consider it. At least go look into it for yourself. Find out for yourself. Most Catholics, I think they find a couple Catholics that they trust and they just believe whatever they say about the Catholic church, which is weird because it's like that guy is now their authority rather than going to the actual like sources <laughs> of Catholic authority, <laughs> the infallible proclamations of the Catholic church. And that's what I want to talk about. 
because I, I can't hold the Catholic Church to what even a pope says in a lot of cases. It's right. got to be the infallible proclamations. Yeah, I talked to a girl one time. I said, do you understand that what you believe is not in the Bible? And she said, oh, I just listened to my, my priest. He tells me what to do and I'm good to go. And yeah. I'm like, who does that? But apparently a lot of people do. So I think that's why, why this is so important. We talked about something and I'll tell you, this is where I, I if there's one doctrine in the, the church that I say, I'm sorry, this just throws everything out. It's this whole idea of purgatory to me. And it's just so, it, it, it flies in the face of what Jesus did. Um, we had a, another guest speaker come in and talk about a whole different subject one time. And I got to talking about what we were going to do here. And I brought up that we were going to bring in Catholicism. And he just freaked out on me. <laughs> and I was like, okay, just tell me about this for a second. If, if, if you were a Baptist church or a Presbyterian church or a Methodist church, and you were like, oh, by the way, when you die, you have to pay for your own sins, like whatever's left over. I said, we would kick them so far out. Like, why are we just giving the Catholic church a pass on this? And so that was, that was my, my thought process on it. So let's, let's talk about purgatory because it's like, it's, it's not even anywhere biblical. It's not even a biblical concept. So explain that. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any place for purgatory. There, there's two issues here though. Let me just say this. The issue is, is there a purgatory? I think the answer is going to be no, but biblically speaking. And the second issue is, if, if it's there, why are you there? What are you doing? Right? Like, what are you accomplishing while you're there? Um, because it's one thing to say, oh, you're there because you're undergoing sanctification. Like, just God's working on your character. And it's something else to say, you're paying for your sins, which is something Jesus did. <laughs> That's a different, so there's a different claim. So I just want to try to be clear here. Um, so, you know, biblically, we have hell for the unsaved, heaven for the saved, to put it, you know, eventually heaven and earth are joined together in, in the future, but that's the destination for the saved, whereas hell for the unsaved. But purgatory is the place to go for the saved who still need to suffer for their sins. That's on Catholic theology. Um, one of the things you do there is character change. And if you talk to a lot of modern Catholics, they will make it sound like that's all you do there. And all you do in purgatory is you just have character transformation. Like, oh, you're, you're just becoming more Christ-like and more godly. You wouldn't want to go to heaven yet because you're not ready, because you still have all these things you have to work with and deal through, work through. And now to me, I say, well, that doesn't, that's wrong, but I don't think that that compromises the gospel, right? I, I think I label that as a secondary error and not a primary error. I think that they, they misunderstand the nature of the flesh, that what the scripture teaches about the flesh is like, when I die, this flesh is gone. I'm going to put on incorruption. And that's going to be this major sanctification that takes place in our lives. And I'm very much looking forward to it um, because as long as I'm in this flesh, I will not be ready for heaven <laughs> and okay. for the presence and glory of God, but I'll be rid of this flesh the moment I die. And thank God for that. Um, but on Catholic theology, that's not all that happens in purgatory. Um, you are paying for your sins to get holy enough to enter heaven. The Catholic encyclopedia says this, they are not so good as to be entitled to eternal happiness. And that's why they go to purgatory. So we, they're not entitled to eternal. I'm not entitled. I'm not, nobody's so good as to be entitled to eternal happiness. It's all Jesus. But right. in Catholicism, it's, it's Jesus plus you. So you're the, you're the weak link, obviously, in this, in this formula. Um, let's quote from the catechism. I'm going to quote a lot of their authoritative text here. So um, the catechism it says in 1030, uh, paragraph 1030, all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, are indeed assured of their eternal salvation, but after death they undergo purification so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. So it's like there's a prerequisite to entering heaven that you have to achieve um, through your goodness, your holiness, and that's why you're in purgatory. In 1031, it goes on and says, the church gives the name purgatory to this final purification of the elect. Notice the word purification. I, I've uh, underlined a bit there for us, um, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned, right? It's not hell. The church formulated her doctrine of faith on purgatory, especially at the councils of Florence and Trent. The tradition of the church by reference to certain texts of scripture speaks of a cleansing fire. As for certain lesser faults, we must believe that before the final judgment, there is a purifying fire. These are for faults. I'm being purified by fire. From the beginning of the church has honored, from the beginning, the church has honored the memory of the dead and offered prayers and suffrage for them above all the Eucharist sacri Eucharistic sacrifice. 
so that thus purified, they may attain the beatific vision of God. The church also commends almsgiving, indulgences, and works of penance undertaken on behalf of the dead. Let us help and commemorate them. If Job's sons were purified by their father's sacrifice, why would we doubt that our offerings for the dead bring them some consolation? Let us not hesitate to help those who have died and to offer our prayers for them. So um, there's a lot that we can unpack there, but let me just say for those in purgatory, they're suffering to pay for their sins. Uh, Ludwig Ott, in his book, The Fundamentals of, the, of Catholic Dogma on page 487, he says, the temporal punishments for sins are atoned for in the purifying fire by the so-called suffering of atonement, satis passio, very important word theologically for Catholicism. That is, by the willing bearing of the expiatory punishments imposed by God. Here's what you need to know about this, this paragraph. The, these are all terms that should be said of Jesus, not us. He suffered the punishment for my sin. He atoned for my sin. He was the expiatory sacrifice, right? Bearing the punishment imposed by God for my sin. Like Jesus did all that. To me, the doctrine of purgatory, when it's speaking of me suffering punishment for my sin that Jesus already paid for, it approaches blasphemy. Yeah. I, I'm shocked. And I don't, as much as I'm, I, I feel the inclination to say, come on, Mike, we agree with Catholics on so much. Like, it's not, let's not, let's just hold hands. Right. I'm like, I, I can't hold hands with a, a theology that requires me to let go of Jesus and what he's done for me. And that's ultimately what I think happens with Catholicism. And it breaks my heart. I hope I'm wrong. Someone show me I'm wrong. Right. But I'm convicted that this is the truth. And I'm going to have to say it openly, even, even though I know it makes me a lightning rod. But I mean, that's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. But um. Yeah. So, so not only in purgatory do you suffer for your sins, but also when, when you have friends or relatives in purgatory, you could do good deeds. According to the catechism of the Catholic church, you could do good works like almsgiving works of penance, you know, doing a Eucharist in their name, and this will help purify them from their sin. Now you can't think purgatory is just about growing in character. If you think that your uncle who's alive and you're dead and your, your uncle, he can give money to the church. And it will purify your character more quickly. <laughs> it's not about character. You're making payment for sin. That's what this is. And oh man, um, it's, it's scary. The doctrine is scary to me. Um, it ties you to the Roman Catholic priesthood and the sacraments because now even when, even when say your loved one dies, I'm like, okay, let's help them. Let's get them out of purgatory. The job's not done. Jesus didn't do it all, right? We, we've got we to go to the Eucharist. And, and, and we got to give, give alms and let's, let's do good things to try to help and pray rosaries in their name to try to help them get out of purgatory more quickly. Um, this is, um, I, I don't even, I don't, I wish, I wish it wasn't as big of a deal as it seems like it is. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Well, this is where I just veer right off. I'm like, it's not even, I mean, this is what, this is it. This is my line in the sand. For this. Yeah. So I, I totally get that. Um, do you think, and this is a weird question, but do you think that the, the church did that many years ago in hopes to just, get money like do you think at that point when whoever came up with it's like it's a great way for a church to make money if i'm like hey you need mm -hmm. to pay me and i can get your loved one out or early like yeah um I, I i'm really hesitant to say things like that too too brashly um i think that even in even in the catholic tradition there are a lot of really sincere people like totally sincere oh, absolutely. people can be sincerely wrong you know where they just think oh no this is just we just, we just want to get them out of purgatory, you know, like that could be the whole thing. Um, in the, in, during the Reformation, there was major abuse of indulgences and the church did try, the Catholic church did try to deal with those abuses in the Council of Trent, right? They tried to stop those abuses. There were some horrible abuses. People were just literally, they would give money to the church in anticipation of sins they were about to commit. Hey, I'm going to go cheat on my wife. How much do I need to give you? Um, right. Now, I don't blame Catholicism for that, Right. Because that was an abuse, even in their own view, that was an abuse of their own doctrines and their theology. So I want to grant them that and not put that on them. Um, but um, what I what I think it's more about personally is, um, or I should say, the effect, the part that concerns me, is it's about the the replacing of Jesus with the Catholic Church and right. with its hierarchy and with its sacraments and with its priesthood and with its pope to try to say, look. We're, we have this thing that's foreign to the New Testament, foreign to the, to the actual early church, and it's necessary for your salvation. And that, that to me is the big issue, yeah. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh. All right. Let's talk about, um, let's talk about the Bible. Uh, do they view the Bible differently than we do? Like for us, it's the word of God. And that's, you know what I mean? Like, is that how a Catholic would also view the Bible? Um, definitely. They would absolutely affirm that it's God's inspired word. They would love it. They would, they would uh, have a great affection and, and respect and belief in the authority and fallibility of the inspired scriptures. But there are some big differences um, that aren't related to just the things I said, but there's some other issues that come in. So for instance, there's the Apocrypha or what the Catholics call the Deuterocanonical books. These are 11 Jewish writings that are added into the Catholic Old Testament that are not in everybody else's Old Testament and they're not in even the Jewish Old Testament. Um, Then they also add a mediator. So I have the Bible, but I'm not really... I'm not really good enough to understand the Bible properly. And so only the Catholic church can authoritatively say what the Bible means. That's a really big deal because as soon as you have someone who's the only person who can interpret the Bible um, with, with their uh, apparently infallible and their claimed authority, then all of a sudden the Bible is second and the church is first. And it becomes, you know, we have the sola scriptura is the cry of the Reformation, right? But the scripture alone, and they, what it ultimately turns into in Roman Catholicism is sola ecclesia or, or whatever the church says. It's only the church. And so, um, yeah, now they don't generally interpret. Now, the, the, the Catholic church does not produce Bible studies. Not, I mean, there's Catholics who do, theologians who do, but the church officially, infallibly doesn't ever say, here's what Ephesians means. And they just give you like... A study in all these years, this is, they don't do this. Okay. But this leaves us in a conundrum. Only you can perfectly interpret the Bible, but you don't really interpret the Bible for the most part. What you do is you sometimes refer to scripture and you tell us this is what theology you're supposed to have. So the effect is that whatever doctrine uh, the church teaches, it just trumps whatever you think the Bible is saying. And that's, that's the part that, that is, a, is a problem. So why read the Bible? If I, if I were Catholic, I'd be like, it wouldn't really matter because what if I got I mean, it wrong? So it's just starting not worth it. Yeah. I mean, you, you might read it because you feel like you're supposed to. It, it, maybe, it's, maybe it's like a good thing you can do. You might read it because you just love the scripture. Um, but you ultimately, if, if it looks like the Bible is totally contradicting the Catholic church, you're supposed to believe what Catholicism says, not what the text seems to clearly teach. They, they are right and you are wrong. You, and this, this is the bottom line. You can't prove them wrong. The Roman Catholic Church claims that they are the, the, um, the only ones to interpret the Bible. They also claim they're subject to the scriptures. But what, what's, okay, we're subject to the Bible, guys. How do I know that? Trust us, because we'll tell you what it means. <laughs> Trust me, we're subject to the Bible, because we infallibly declare that we are. It's a bit hollow. Uh, only they can interpret the scripture, ultimately and infallibly. Um, so they're subject to their own interpretations, not to the text itself. So you can't hold them to the scripture because they'll say, well, it doesn't mean what you think it means, right? The, this is the same as actually, this is where there is a par- parallel with uh, Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons. They, they, they do have an extra biblical authority that, um, that you have to take their word over what the apparent teaching of the scripture is. And that is a, a connection there. Now, this is actually totally different than scripture. Uh, in scripture, in Galatians 1, Paul's like, even if an apostle or an angel from heaven comes, and they give you something different than what you've already received, don't listen to them. So he thinks the, the message delivered, the faith delivered once and for all of the saints, he thinks that message, not even an apostle can come and change it. Meaning that an, an angel from heaven, so that no authority, no matter what authority you claim you have, if it doesn't seem to match the plain sense of the scriptures, you can reject that person. And I'm, I'm, I'm with Paul. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when someone says, well, our Bible's better because we have the Apocrypha. What do you say to that? How do you, what is your response to that? Um, Well, let me see. I have a section here. I was going to talk about. about, I can't remember if we did. If we do. How about we come back to that a little bit later? So I don't get lost in notes, but I do have some, some things I'll share about the Apocrypha. Yeah. Uh, Let's talk about traditions because I hear this all the time. We have um, one of our sons, a couple of his friends actually left the Christian church and joined the Catholic church. And these are strong believers. They just were like, Nope, we think that's it. We're following the tradition. And I keep hearing traditions, traditions. And I'm like, I don't think that's what it means. So talk about that. Yeah. So a lot of times when um, Roman Catholic apologetics and theology, when they go into the, into ancient history, they'll, they'll take a word that's being used and they'll interpret it with a modern sense instead of with the ancient sense, like the word Catholic Catholic just meant 
the whole church and to them it means roman catholic right so right. when when you have a church father who's like you know um you know you must you must have the catholic church to be saved and they're thinking haha and you're like that's not what he meant at all like that's completely anachronistic so um vatican ii says this though about tradition it says sacred tradition and sacred scripture form one sacred deposit of the word of God, which is committed to the church. The task of authentically interpreting the word of God, whether written or handed on, has been entrusted exclusively, exclusively to the living teaching office of the church, whose authority is exercised in the name of Jesus Christ. For all of what has been said about the way of interpreting scripture is subject finally to the judgment of the church, which carries out the divine commission and ministry of guarding and interpreting the word of God. So they have, like I said earlier, they're the only ones who can interpret the Bible. Ultimately, authentically is the word they use. And um, uh, tradition, though, the, the idea of tradition, you see it's, a, it's there's like two separate things. There's scripture on one hand and tradition on the other. Tradition is meant to be, this is like what the apostles taught that just wasn't written. That's the idea. That's why they say whether written or handed on. Well, it's handed on. Okay, it's tradition because it's handed on apostolic teaching. But the word tradition is a bit muddy when you start trying to apply it in real life. Um, there's lots of things the Catholic Church teaches as tradition that were clearly not taught by the apostles. Like this, this isn't handed on, right? There's things like the bodily assumption of Mary, papal infallibility, the immaculate conception of Mary. These are doctrines that are unknown in the, in the early church. Literally unknown. Like you can't find anybody who believes in the bodily assumption of Mary that early on, right? Papal infallibility was defined uh, in 1870 at the Vatican II Council, <clears throat> and that particular doctrine was so divisive, a bunch of Catholic theologians left the Catholic Church because they're like, wait, what? You're infallible now? You know, when you, when you, not everything he says is infallible, but in certain conditions. And so they had a big problem with that. Well, these things are just not known historically. There's no way the Apostle Paul taught the or, you know, or Peter taught papal infallibility because there was no papacy. <laughs> they didn't even teach a Pope. It's just, it's, this is really out there. So tradition doesn't really mean tradition. This is a big key issue. When the Catholic church says tradition, what they mean is whatever teachings we affirm and we say, it's always been that way. Trust us. Okay. Right. They don't actually mean that you could go into, into church history and you can gather all these doctrines and figure it out on your own. They have to take a very edited version of the church fathers. Now, the church fathers, it's not like they're evangelical Protestants. I'm not pretending they agree with me. But to pretend they agree with, with at least, I mean, in some ways they do, in some ways they don't. But to pretend they agree with modern Roman Catholicism is just really butchering history. Um, it's just really butchering it. And it, but the problem is, it's so complicated. Like, how long is it going to take me to explain how these 15 church fathers were misunderstood by Catholicism? <laughs> how many hours is it going to take just to explain that? Now, there's one verse we'll talk about. Um, this is the verse most commonly used to support the idea that tradition in the modern Catholic sense, meaning whatever teachings they currently have um, and they say is historical, that that is in the Bible. So um, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, it says, So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught by us, either by our spoken word or by our letter. Now, the first thing you should notice is that Paul says that the traditions he's talking about, the key word here is tradition, right? But what he says, when he defines it, he says it's either by word or epistle. So he doesn't have, like the Vatican, two categories. Scripture here, tradition here. Scripture is what's written. Tradition is what's handed down verbally and not written. That He doesn't have that. He's like, tradition is whatever I said, whether it was written or oral. That's right. tradition. So he's not using it in the Catholic sense at all. He's just using the word in a whole different kind of content. He just means whatever the apostles taught publicly. Stand and hold fast to that. All I have to do to break the Roman Catholic claim is show that at least some of the things they say are authoritative tradition were definitely not taught by the apostles. And then it breaks their connection that the modern claims about tradition don't relate to what Paul was talking about in First Thess or Second Thessalonians. Okay. He didn't teach it to them. It wasn't taught to I, them originally. Yeah. Roman yeah. Catholic theology, <laughs> it, it just misses how Second Thessalonians defines tradition. Some Roman Catholic uh, apologists do have a nuanced view of this. But it doesn't do anything to support their claims. Is the that's the point? Okay. Um, okay. So you make a you make a really great statement when you talk about how Catholicism would actually crumble if if you got rid of this whole church authority thing. 
-hmm. because that's where most of these unbiblical documents or uh, doctrines come from. And, and they come from that because of the authority of the church. So if you can prove that the authority of the church is not a biblical thing, then it kind of wipes away Catholicism. So explain that. Yeah. Now, just so you know, I affirm church authority in many ways. There's lots of, uh, there's, there's legitimate authority in the church. The biblical way of looking at it is that we have the teaching of the apostles, which we have recorded in the New Testament, that we must hold fast to. That, that trumps every authority, right? Even if an angel of heaven and all that stuff. So, but then we have um, uh, leaders in the church in the New Testament. We, they're elders and bishops, same person. Those terms are used interchangeably. And then we have deacons. Okay, and these are kind of the offices in the church that are to be appointed. Um, there's other functions in the church, but those are the offices. But in Catholicism, the authority of the church takes on a whole new dimension, whole un, just totally not found in scripture at all. And that's about the Pope. Centrally, it, it brings it, it comes down to the Pope. The unity and the teaching and the authority and the claims of the Catholic Church come down to the Pope. So um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 937, says this. The Pope enjoys, by divine institution, nothing less than supreme, full, immediate, and universal power in the care of souls. Um, 883 says this, the college or body of bishops, these are Catholic bishops, has no authority unless united with the Roman pontiff, that's the Pope, Peter's successor as its head. As such, this college has supreme and full authority over the universal church, but this power cannot be exercised without agree the agreement of the Roman pontiff. So, I mean, he is the key. You know, with Pope, you have total authority. Everybody else in the world without Pope, you don't have that authority. Like, th this is the claim of the church. Um, in uh, Vatican I, they make some specific claims about this papacy, this idea of this Pope, this one ruler of the church. And... Notice this, that they claim that it's ancient and constant, that the beliefs that they're about to, it, so hold on, let me back up and just say this. In Vatican I, they've just finished saying that in Matthew 16 and in John 21, that we have Jesus instituting Peter as the first Pope. Then they go on and they say here in Vatican I, everyone has always known this. So remember this claim, we're going to test it. It says, we for the preservation, safekeeping, and increase of the Catholic flock, with the approval of the sacred council, judge it to be necessary to propose for the belief and acceptance of all the faithful in accordance with the ancient and constant faith of the universal church, the doctrine of the institution, perpetuity, and nature of the sacred apostolic primacy. Now, this is massive because what they've just done is they've said the nature of this pope of having supreme authority over everything, this has always been known. Everybody knew it, and it's especially in Matthew 16 and John 21. Well, those are the two passages they offer. Um, if this is true, I want to be Catholic. <laughs> like if that's true, I want to be Catholic because I'm not opposed to being some in submission to proper authorities. That's, a, that's what I want to do. But if it's not true, it's a pretty big issue. Uh, I can't just, I can't, like, uh, I've heard one prominent evangelical pastors say the Pope is our Pope. He's like, he's our Pope. And I'm like, there is no Pope. He's it's, if it's not true, he's a usurper claiming massive authority claims that just are completely unfounded and then giving doctrines authoritatively based on those claims. So this is a big deal. Um, now, biblically speaking, Matthew 16 um, is where Jesus says like, you know, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom, Peter, you're the rock. And, um, and, and on this rock, I will build, you are, you are Peter the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. It's that phrase. Now, the, the weird thing is this, if, if you were just doing a Bible study, you, you would, you might be like, wait, is Peter the rock? Or is the claim that Jesus is the Messiah? Is that the rock? You, you would be asking those questions. What do the keys mean? Huh? let's go through the rest of the New Testament. What, how did they, how are the keys used? Like, what is this all talking about? But the Catholic church says like, no, when, when Jesus says, here's the keys, you're, you know, Peter, you are Peter the rock. What he's really doing is he's instituting that Peter is the Pope. He's the leader of all the apostles. Um, he has the full authority of Christ on earth. And everybody else in the world, if they don't agree with him, they have no authority. If they agree with him, they have his authority effectively, right? This is the authority claims. And that Peter is then going to establish the Rome as the future location where this, where this future papacy is going to continue to exist. And it will, be, it will exist in perpetuity. It's not just for the first century. It's forever. Like all that's coming out of like your 
the, you're a rock and here's the keys. Right. This is not how we do Bible study. Right? This is like in Mormonism when they say, well, Paul said three heavens. So we have celestial, terrestrial, and telestial. <laughs> you're like, wait a minute. You just literally made up a word. <laughs> telestial it doesn't really <laughs> exist. Like that's not how you do Bible study. So did the apostles think um, that this made Peter above them and leading the church as basically the head of the church after this? Um, I'll give you several reasons really quickly why not. We, we could spend all day on this one verse, <laughs> but, um, but we won't. So one, uh, the apostles continued to argue about who was the greatest, both in Matthew and in Luke, and even in the Garden of Gethsemane, way after Jesus supposedly gave apostolic primacy to Peter. Why are they arguing who's the greatest? Right. Like, and why isn't Jesus like, obviously Peter's the greatest, you numbskulls. Like, didn't you see me? I gave him the keys. <laughs> um, in Matthew 18, Jesus supplies the keys and binding and loosing. He applies it to the whole church, not just Peter. Peter's kind of like was seen as a spokesman, not as the single head of the church, especially in Matthew 18 verses 18 through 20. Binding and loosing the activity of the keys is seen as giving, being given to the church as a whole. Peter, again, he's the spokesman. He's not the Pope. He speaks what the church is thinking, and then he responds to that claim. In uh, number three, in Acts chapter 15, there's a council in the early church, the first council we read about in, in anywhere in history, and it's James, not Peter, who seems to push the final decision, seems to be leading. Peter has an is important role. I don't, I'm not against Peter. He has an important role, but we can't call that papacy in action. Acts 15 doesn't look like that at all. Right. Uh, number four, Paul, he, he actually offers us a description of Peter's ministry. And he doesn't say supreme pontiff of the universal church. He doesn't say head of the church, um, vicar of Christ. He says that, that, that Peter says that, sorry, Paul says that Peter is the apostle to the Jews. Wait, that doesn't even fit if he's the Pope, right? The Pope is, it's universal. There's no, there's no to the Jews thing going on here. So, um, Paul actually lists in one point where he lists the pillars of the church in Galatians, he puts them in this order, James, Cephas, which is Peter and John, James, Cephas, John. You don't now when you're when you're listing and the Pope is on your list. Guess who comes first? <laughs> the Pope, right? Um, now then he goes on to say that these three pillars agreed that Paul should go to the Gentiles and the three of them should go to the circumcised, and they're considered about reaching apostolically, evangelically out to the world. There's no there's no idea in their head of a of a papacy going on right now. Peter calls himself a fellow elder. In his in First Peter chapter five, he also calls Jesus the chief shepherd. So he's just a fellow elder, right? I'm just a fellow elder. Jesus is the chief shepherd. This isn't just humility. He's just giving us a description of, you know, the way things really are. And then finally, a seventh thing I'll, I'll mention is that continuing offices in the church are mentioned throughout the New Testament. We we read about them all the time. We never read about a pope, and it would be pretty significant to give us that indication, right? Yeah. If you're, yeah. you're pretending to have an office that the New Testament knows nothing about. So here's an example. Catholic historian, Eamon Duffy. He's a Catholic historian. He says, there is nothing directly approaching a papal authority in the pages of the New Testament. Yeah. Nothing. yeah. In, uh, in Roman, um, sorry, in Roman, but not Catholic, that book I recommended earlier, um, they, they write this. The substance of Matthew 16, 18, you are Peter and on this rock, I will build my church was never interpreted, catch that, never interpreted by the first century church in terms of claims to preeminence by a non-existent monarchical bishop of Rome, or even later by the apostolic fathers once this office eventually emerged. That's because historically in the first century, there was a lot of different you know, leaders in Rome, bishops or elders in Rome. There wasn't even one who was in charge of them all. Like that took a whole development of history before that even started to happen. So it's just, it's just weird. Um, but in Vatican one, they say that Matthew 16 has always been understood to make Peter the Pope and for it to talk about apostolic primacy, that Peter's the boss of the church and he's in charge of everybody else. It has quote ever been understood this way. So this means I can test a historical and biblical claim of, of a infallible council of the Catholic church in Vatican one. Well, the French Roman Catholic Lenoy he surveyed the writings of the church fathers to see what the early church said about Matthew 16. Did they say that this made him the Pope? He found 17 citations from church fathers who agreed that Matthew 16, when he says the rock, it's referring to Peter. 
So 17 citations that make Peter the rock. Now, they did not say that Peter was the Pope. Most of them don't even talk about that because it was historically didn't exist yet. But they did say that the phrase the rock referred to Peter. He found 16 citations that identify the rock as Christ. So those are split 50-50. He found eight that identified the rock as all of the disciples. Not just Peter, but all the disciples. And he found 44 citations that identified the rock as the confession that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. So the favorite interpretation of the, of the church fathers is that the rock is the confession of trusting Christ as God. Mm-hmm. Now, 80% of the time, the church fathers disagree with the Roman Catholic position. 80%. Yet Vatican I says that this has always ever been the, knowing, the known belief of the universal church. Because Vatican I made stuff up, which is why a lot of Roman Catholics left when Vatican I in 1870 came out and said this stuff. And they're like, yeah, that's that's just not real. It's not true. But the the, the Pope of the time was demanding that they affirm these things. And uh, they they even argued, at one point, the council people were like, we don't want to say some of these things. and, and, And the church isn't in agreement. Look, we're voting. We are not in agreement about all these things you want in the council. And the Pope said, I am the church. And so they... They had to continue pushing it forward because some popes are not as humble as, as Francis. Um, and right. it's, you get, it's a mixed bag. So there's no papacy. In the, the, yeah, oh, if you got rid sorry, of the go papacy totally, then it, the whole thing crumbles. Yeah, it, it, becomes, it becomes a usurping claim. Instead of, instead of there, there is no authentic papacy to look for in the first century. It doesn't right. exist. So you can't trace it to any modern person because the, the ancient thing never was there in the first place. It developed over time. So it was very gradual. Um, so there was, I'll do it in a couple stages here. Um, initially, there were, like I said, multiple elders or bishops in Rome. There was not just one who was in charge of them all. Um, that's during the first century. Late, late in the second century, then we start to get a monarchical bishop. Well, one bishop who's like, I'm in charge of the region of Rome, but he's not like the Pope. He's not claiming, you know, universal authority over the world and over every every Christian. That's centuries later, but that's when you first start to get it. Over a hundred years later, we first start to get the idea of someone who's the guy who's in charge of Rome. Um, The historian Kenneth Collins, he says this, clearly Rome continually reads back into the past much later historical products as if they were ever present. To claim, for example, that the apostle Peter was the first Pope is akin to the error in stating in the fourth century, the United States of America had few people. Because there was no United States. It just didn't exist. Such a statement simply doesn't compute. The city that was of such great importance to the Christian faith in the mid-first century was not Rome, but Jerusalem. And after that, it was Antioch, thus once again, not Rome. The earliest pope who you could probably start to say is looking at claiming some of the power of the modern pope, right? Like he's not only saying like, I'm the bishop of Rome altogether, but he's starting to like flex a little more is leo in the fifth century that's that's one of the earliest guys you could say here's a guy who you know some would argue he's actually a pope we actually have a pope now you know in the modern somewhat modern sense but let me let me read to you here's a book i recommend this is the the matthew 16 controversy people want to read on just matthew 16 just that one issue here's a whole book for you (laughs) early church fathers and what they said but allow me to read to you this is gregory the great he is the 64th Pope, if you ask the Roman Catholic Church. Right? They say they have all these popes. According to them, he is the 64th Pope. So by now, right, There's everybody knows what the papacy is now in all its authority claims. But Gregory the Great actually rejected the title Pope for himself and, it's, and rejected some of the official titles that are currently part of the Pope. He rejected those things. But he had a letter uh, that he wrote to John of the Bishop of Constantinople. Now, John, the Bishop of Constantinople at the time, they were kind of like, they were all rising in power. The bishops were getting more and more heavy headed and and big headed in in their power beyond the New Testament, right? Now, Constantinople is one of the, one of the cities that's like trying to claim a lot more authority than he ought to have. Mm -hmm. And so look at what Gregory writes, because this guy calls himself the universal head that he's, he's the one in charge. He basically claims to be a Pope, the Bishop of Constantinople. Listen to what Gregory, quote, the Pope says about him. It says, um, what will thou say to Christ, who is the head of the universal church in the scrutiny of the last judgment, having attempted to put all his members under the, thyself by the appellation of universal? 
He's opposed to not only that guy doing it, anybody calling himself the universal head of the church. And he's like, you're, you're going to get judged for that. Let me read on. And when thou desirest to put thyself above them by this proud title and to tread down their name in comparison with thine, what else dost thou say, but I will ascend into heaven? I will exalt my throne above the stars of heaven. Are not all the bishops together clouds who both reign in the words and preaching and glitter in the light of good works? And when your fraternity despises them and you would fain press them down under yourself, what else say you but what is said by the ancient foe, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. He's, he's saying, if, if you want to try to say you're higher than other bishops, which even at that point, the concept of bishops going beyond the New Testament, so I don't agree with it. But basically, like, if you're going to be the one who's above all the others, that's satanic, right? He quotes Satan. He's like, that's satanic. Let me read on. Certainly, Peter, the first of the apostles himself, a member of the Holy and Universal Church, Paul, Andrew, and John, what were they? Now, here is get ready for it, right? Here's Pope Gregory, supposedly Pope Gregory, right? The guy who rejects the title Pope, um, still exercising more power than he should biblically. But he is now writing about who Peter was in the church, right? Certainly Peter, Paul, Andrew, and John, what were they? But heads of particular communities. Oh, wow. Peter was just a head of a particular community, according to Gregory, who's one of the, like, this is part of the problem with Catholic tradition is that there's all these conflicting statements, even in the tradition. So you have to look at the modern church to tell you what you're supposed to hold on to and what you're supposed to reject. But here's a Pope saying something that would, that Vatican II would say, no, he, he didn't, he didn't say that, you know? Um, Anyway, he goes on, he says, now let your holiness, he calls the other guy, your holiness, let your holiness acknowledge to what extent you will swell within yourself and desiring to be called by that name by which no one presumed to be called who is truly holy. He goes on. He has other uh, writings to like the Bishop of Alexandria when they write back and forth. And the Bishop of Alexandria addresses him as like universal Pope. And he hates it. Right. He writes to the Bishop of Alexandria. Yeah, isn't that interesting? He says, you have thought it fit to make use of a proud appellation calling me universal Pope. But I beg your most sweet holiness to do this no more, since what is given to another beyond what reason demands is subtracted from yourself. See, Gregory's concern is that um, the the bishop in Alexandria, he thought had equal authority as him. And he says, you call me this, you take away your own authority. That's interesting, isn't it? He goes on and says, for if your holiness calls me universal pope, you deny that you are yourself what you call me universally. But far far be this from us, away with words that inflate vanity and wound charity. Right. And it, it goes on and on. I could, I could read pages and pages of content. Now in this book, um, Matthew, the Matthew 16 controversy by William Webster, there are a lot of uh, church fathers that are quoted by Catholics to suggest that they believed in the papacy. Right. He offers their quotes in more detail and more context. So you can see that they, they didn't even know about the papacy, right? It didn't exist at that early time because it's well, that's a what we slow said. development over time. We talked about this, like if you were stuck on an island with just your Bible, it's just like you'd never come up with the Mormon church. You'd never come up with Jehovah Witness. You would never come up with the papacy. That's that's kind of the thing. Yeah. Okay. We only have uh, like uh, 18 minutes left. Okay. I want to talk about Mary. I want to probably finish out on Mary because that's kind of a big, a big deal. Um, mother of Jesus, of course, totally blessed by God because this was, you know, God gives her the, you know, uh, Jesus, <laughs> that's kind of a big deal, but they've added so many unbiblical doctrines, the perpetual virginity, the bodily assumption, Mary is co-redemptrix, like you can pray to her, like there's just so many things. So, yeah. so let's really focus on that because it, it's such a false uh, doctrine that people get sucked into. So, so talk mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. So especially in the middle ages, what the Catholic church did was they didn't look they weren't care. I mean, in all reality, they're not carrying traditions from the apostles. It's like they put their thumbs in the air and they go, Ooh, this doctrine's become more and more popular in the church. We're going to, we're going to say it's true now. Like, and so they kind of follow the sway and flow of things and these influences that are a lot more than the Bible or the Holy spirit. And one of those influences was the continued exaltation of Mary. Um, so one of those doctrines they have nowadays that, that the early church wouldn't have had is uh, catech- the Catholic catechism has in paragraph 491, It says, the most blessed Virgin Mary was from the first moment of her conception by a singular grace and privilege of Almighty God and by virtue of the merits of Jesus Christ, Savior of the human race, preserved immune from all stain of original sin. 
So a lot of people think that immaculate conception refers to Jesus. That's the virgin birth. Immaculate conception actually is a reference to Mary. The idea is that she was born without sin. In page, uh, paragraph 493, it goes on to say, by the grace of God, Mary remained free from every personal sin her whole life long. So Mary is sinless. Actually, Mary is the first sinless human being on Catholicism before, before Christ. She's always sinless. Now, there's nothing in the New Testament uh, like that, that would supply this belief. It, it's just not there. Now, um, there's a lot more that can be said. And the, the Mary stuff, it, it's hard because a lot of Protestants, it's almost like they feel like they have to bash Mary or something. And I mean, that's wrong. Like That's just, that's terrible. Uh, Mary is wonderful. I think Mary would be offended and bothered by the claims of Catholicism about Mary. I think she'd feel uncomfortable and would rebuke them for these claims. But here's some more of those claims. Uh, Catechism 964 says, there she stood in keeping with the divine plan, enduring with her only begotten son, the intensity of his suffering, joining herself with his sacrifice in her mother's heart. So Mary, it sounds like she is part of the sacrifice for our sins. Well, in, in 966, as we read on, it says, finally, the immaculate virgin preserved free from all stain of original sin when the course of her earthly life was finished, was taken up body and soul into heavenly glory and exalted by the Lord as queen over all things so that she might be the more fully conformed to her son, the Lord of Lords and conqueror of sin and death. In giving birth, you kept your virginity. In your dormition, you did not leave the world. O mother of God, but were joined to the source of life. You, you conceived the living God and by your prayers will deliver our souls from death. Ah. Shocking stuff. So that, that's the bodily assumption of Mary. That's another doctrine that was utterly unknown in the early church. You can't find support for it in the early church fathers. Even, um, even if you could, it would, it would be some weirdo and not <laughs> representing actual Christian teaching. Um, in 968, it goes on, it says in a wholly singular way, she cooperated by her obedience, faith, hope, and burning charity in the savior's work of restoring supernatural life to souls. For this reason, she is a mother to us in the order of grace so she helps Jesus save us. Mary is the, is the first sinless human who suffers along with Jesus, helping his sacrifice accomplish our salvation. This is, um, this is blasphemous. Mm -hmm. in, in 969, the next paragraph, it says, taken up to heaven, she did not lay aside the saving office. She has an office of saving us. But by her manifold intercession continues to bring us the gifts of eternal salvation. Therefore, the Blessed Virgin is invoked in the church under the titles Advocate, Helper, Benefactress, and Mediatrix. So Mediatrix is like a feminine form of mediator, right? She's, she's the medi a mediator. Um, what, 1 Timothy 2.5, it says this about our mediator, right? There's one God and there's one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. Mary would be embarrassed and ashamed and appalled oh, at the I claims agree. of Catholicism. About Mary. And so would early Christians. First Christians would just be blown away by this stuff. Now, Marian devotion grows as we see church history move on. Hundreds of years go by. By 1,000 and 1,100 B, uh, uh, AD in particular, it starts to get like off the rails. It sure does. Um, now, let me take you to one section of the, because you guys know the Hail Mary prayer. Hail Mary, it says, Mother of God, Lord is with you. You know, that, that prayer, part of the rosary, part of the things they pray all the time. This is the catechism of the Catholic Church, um, 2677. This is where they're explaining the prayer. And when they get to the part at the end of the prayer where it says, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, here's how they explain it. By asking Mary to pray for us, we acknowledge ourselves to be poor sinners and we address ourselves to the mother of mercy, the all holy one. We give ourselves over to her now in the today of our lives. And our trust broadens further already at the present moment to surrender the hour of our death, wholly to her care. May she be there as she was at her son's death on the cross. May she welcome us as the mother at the, as our mother at the hour of our passing to lead us to her son, Jesus in paradise. On a practical level, Catholicism makes Mary um, Jesus, right? Like she, she takes away parts, uh, parts of Jesus. Like she participates in a sacrifice. She leads us to Jesus. Jesus is still the good guy, right? But she's going to lead me to Jesus. Mary's the one I'm entrusting my soul to. And, um, do I, how much do I have to comment on this to show how weird it is? The fact that, that, that a Catholic could read these things and not see the problem is 
is that they're rooted in their traditions and not in the word of God. Exactly. Well, it's, it's, it's terrifying to me. It's like all of these religions that we've talked about, they've just added things that, that don't even make sense. And it takes away, it's like, we have friends that are Catholic and, and I hear more about Mary than I do Jesus. Like it's, and I'm like, I, there's just something really wrong with that. And then explain why people pray to Mary. Like, where does this even come from? Yeah, well, so I mean, part of it you could see from these claims, Mary is actually a source of mercy for you. Okay. And in a practical level, Catholics often see Mary as more loving than Jesus. So they often would prefer to pray to, pray to Mary because she's like more nice and gentle. <laughs> she's seen that way, like in Cana, like Jesus is like, what does your concern have to do with me? You know, and Mary's like, oh, come on. <laughs> you know, and like, if, like she'll influence her motherly uh, influence on Jesus to have him be more merciful, perhaps. This is the, this is the practical application to a lot of Catholics prayer life. So they often will pray to Mary instead. Um, but in Roman Catholicism, uh, saints are people who are, if someone's declared to be a saint, it's not like the biblical view. The biblical view is if you're a Christian, you're a saint, right? You're, you're saved. Right. Everyone, everyone who's saved is a saint. The Catholic view is that saints, uh, while they would affirm that they would add another new category of saint. And they would say, well, when we say saint, you know, what we mean is someone who after they died, they, they, even if they went to purgatory for a time, they're in heaven now. They're in heaven now. And because they're in heaven, they have special access to God. And they have um, excess works that they are be above and beyond what they needed for their salvation. And so now you can pray to them and get their help in, in your life today. So you start praying to them. Now, there's prayers in the Bible, including Mary. Mary's the chief one that people pray to. There's prayers in the Bible from Genesis all the way through to the book of Revelation. And you know how many of them are addressed to saints or angels or anybody other than God? None. Right. This just doesn't happen. I mean, well, yeah, it does. I get when pagans do it, right? but not, not like the approved of prayers in the scripture in numerous places, the old Testament actually condemns all attempts to communicate with the dead and it doesn't qualify it. It's just like Deuteronomy 18 verses 10 through 12, Leviticus 20 verse six and 27, first Samuel 28 verse five through 18, Isaiah eight verses 19 through 20. It condemns all attempts to communicate with the dead, with those who have passed on. Right. Uh, the Roman Catholic rescue is they say, well, I'm not praying to them. Really? I'm asking them to pray for me. And Mike, you would say, Hey, Lisa, will you pray for me? I'm going through this, right? That's okay. It's okay to ask people to pray for you. And you go, well, yeah, of course it is. And they go, well, that's all we're doing. We're just asking these wonderful men and women of God to pray for us. And that's like really clever. Yeah. But it kind of ignores the part about them being dead. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, exactly. They're dead. Like that, that, that didn't even address the issues that we dealt with in, in scripture about prayers not being given uh, to anyone other than God. Right. So they do, you know, various things like the veneration of saints. They make images. They bow physically down to the images of the saints. They light candles. They pray to the saints. They thank the saints, including Mary, especially. And these are all the same things the Old Testament forbids doing that thing, doing those things towards other than God. Right. Even with God, you don't make an image. Right. But but the Catholic Church, this is why the, the Catholic Ten Commandments is slightly altered from what you read. If you read through the Catholic Ten Commandments and you compare it to, say, Exodus, you'll notice the de-emphasis of, of making idols. They'll just, they'll just de-emphasize that part of the commandments because it, I think it just, it's uncomfortable with their theology. Yeah. yeah. All of this just makes me sad because it's like, I don't know how people can get so far away from the gospel and yet they are. And there's a billion of these people out there and they, I don't know how to reach them. And I think that's what I was hoping for this segment is like, how can we reach you to make you say, go to the Bible? Now, what would you say to people? Like, what, what would what would you ask of them to do after today? Well, let me say this. I, I think that a lot of Catholics are Christians. Um, and, and, and I mean, are saved. I, I think Catholicism is a Christian tradition in many ways, but it compromises the gospel. So I, I feel hesitancy calling it Christian because the gospel's right. essential. But I think a lot of Catholics are saved and that if you ask them about their beliefs, I, I've talked to Catholics where they share. I had a conversation with a Catholic apologist for like an hour and a half, like I don't know, a month and a half, two months ago. And I was just like, can we just talk? I just, I want to have dialogue, friendly dialogue on these issues. And we talked for like an hour and a half. I asked him to explain to me how people are saved, finally saved before God. And I know the double speak and I know the different definitions of languages and things like that. So I'm listening and I go, what he just described to me is the biblical gospel. And I told him, I was like, you just described the same gospel I affirm. Right. I think that's beautiful. I am 
you, I, I can't understand, I can't understand how relieved I am talking to this gentleman thinking he just described the biblical gospel, right? <laughs> he affirmed the gospel of Christ. Like I'm excited about this. So then I share with him the council of Trent. And I said, help me understand how you view these quotes from Trent, which seem to conflict with the gospel you just proclaimed. And I read to him the quotes I shared with you earlier today. And at first he said, Hmm, wait, can you read that again? <laughs> and then I read it again. And he said, yeah, I'm not really sure what to do with that. Yeah. Now here's the good news. A lot of Catholics aren't sure what to do with that. Exactly. Right? Like Maybe just because it's the know. official, yeah, just because it's the official teaching of the church doesn't mean they know it. And even if they know it, doesn't mean that they actually believe it. Yeah. So they may be saved and I'm very hopeful and very optimistic, but it's a fearful optimism because I realize they're being raised in a tradition that does contradict the very essence of the gospel of Christ. And so there's a good chance they're getting the, a false gospel or a, an inadequate understanding of the gospel. And many Catholics will say this. They left the Catholic church. They had to come to an evangelical church to hear the gospel for the first time. And many would say that that's their story. So I'm, a, I'm fearfully agnostic about the salvation of any individual Catholic. I just, I'm scared because I don't, it's not up to me and I don't know what they affirm. But um, what I would encourage a Catholic listening to this to do is, is calm your heart and know that there may be a difference between allegiance to Jesus and allegiance to the Pope, between allegiance to God and allegiance to the councils and the traditions of the Catholic Church. You have... Up until now, you've always seen Roman Catholicism as simply the true one church. But if their claims about the papacy aren't true, then it's actually a sectarian group that has added a lot of extra teachings. And you need to go back to the word of God and you need to find out what scripture says. Perfect. See, I can, uh, there's no other way to end except what you just said. <laughs> so Mike, thank you so much for doing this. I know yeah. you're going to. You're going to sleep well tonight. We do know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. We so appreciate this. I'm sorry that we didn't get to meet in person and you couldn't come to Phoenix, but um, one of these days I'm going to get you here. Okay. So <laughs> I'll, I'll talk to the one girl that, uh, that I'm supposed to talk to. There you go. <laughs> so, so All right. I'll do you want to pray it. for people really quick? Will you say, will you Absolutely. pray for prayer? Absolutely. Absolutely. And then let me say this too, before we go, um, I am not, replacing the Pope with me. Uh, I'm not like the infallible <laughs> Mike Winger. I'm open to changing my mind. I, I wish, I want to change my mind on this. I, yeah. It's just that I'm, it's not an uninformed opinion. Um, and I've shared with you guys what builds that opinion. If you could show me where I'm wrong, I'm all, I'm all ears. Please show me that the Catholic gospel is a saving gospel. Oh, I so want to affirm that. Um, but according to, the, to Trent, it's not. Probably in many parishes it is, but not according to the official teachings of the church. And that's a big problem. So um, that being said, let's, let's pray. Uh, Lord, we, we acknowledge Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who died on the cross and rose again, who paid the full price for our sin and made one offering forever and then sat down at the right hand of God, having perfected forever those who are being sanctified. We acknowledge that we're saved by grace alone through faith. And it's apart from works. It's, it's not from ourselves, lest anyone should boast. And yet, yet, Works are the fruit of your work in our life that do come definitely come naturally because we're born again. But all the credit and all the merit for our salvation, our justification, it's all yours. And we rejoice in that. Help, Lord, help Catholics who might be watching this to just seek Christ, to find truth, and to not have their world destroyed by um, by either blind allegiance to Catholicism or by not being able to discover the truth of Christ through all the confusion. And we pray, Lord God, for, that you bless them, that you use this video and this teaching to minister to people and to create more light than heat. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you for everyone who joined us. Um, Mike, thank you. Yeah, we'll thank you.